All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from a, a sunny San Diego. We're not saying that all the time right now, but it's today it's sunny. And I'm delighted to be joined from New York City by Marissa Freeman. How are you doing, Marissa? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm yeah, so happy here. Yeah, Marissa is the Chief Marketing Officer of Union Square Hospitality Group, uh, leads the marketing and communications, and is an accomplished, globally recognized business and creative leader, combining impactful strategies with thoughtful branding to improve business and drive profitability. You were the former uh, Chief Brand Officer at Hewlett Packard, where you were responsible for navigating the historic split of HP into two Fortune 50 brands, and remember that well. And uh, prior to that, you um, held executive positions at uh, world class ad agencies, including BBDO, B DDB, and Deutsch LA. And you worked on some interesting accounts over the year, like DirecTV, Gillette, Staples, and Hasbro. And what we're going to talk today is about brand because it's kind of one of those subjects that I never get tired of talking about and asking and discussing with people because I always get slightly different insights from from people I and mean, especially people like yourself who really you know done this and lived this for like the majority of their career always have slightly deeper insights than than maybe some other people because I think brand is still to a large degree branding and brand is somewhat misunderstood it's still thought of in many ways as if you mention oh we're going to go through a branding exercise oh we're going to change the logo are we and you're going, well, maybe not, because that's really not the point of the whole thing. But anyway, <laughs> so um, maybe just to start off, let me give you your definition of brand. Well, my definition of brand is um, is what people buy into. Mm -hmm. It's not what people buy. So a product is something that people buy. A service is something that people buy. But a brand is what what you stand for as as an entity. It states your purpose. And it gives others a reason to join you. And that's that's what I I believe truly at, in the highest order, what a brand is. And therefore, with that definition of brand, right, therefore, every interaction that your business has with somebody from the very first time they discover the brand to perhaps sales to support you, whatever, all of those interactions uh, go into their perception of the brand, right? That's right. It's it's about the experience that one has with your with your business, um, and that's everything from the music in the restaurant, or the person who answers the phone to take the reservation, or the loyalty app, uh, and the first message they get uh, for of a secret menu item. You know, that's in my business. Um, mm -hmm. In every business, it's every interaction that someone has with every part of your company, and so. The customer journey is critical. You have to understand when are they first coming into contact with our brand? And most brands now live out in the wild. It's not okay. like people come to your website and that's the first experience they mm -hmm. have with you. Um, they might encounter you on Instagram uh, or on a store shelf or as a collaboration partner of someone else, you know, and that it's it's very important that that as well. You know, your my mom used to say you're judged by the company you keep. Yeah. And so when you think about partnerships, you have to think long and hard. Do your brand values overlap? Yes, it might be great that the, that partner will bring you additional customers, but are those customers the kind of customers that your current base will, will feel akin to? You know, it's important. Yeah, I love that. That's a that's a that's a really good point, and I think that's one that I don't think has been raised before. I, I I love that about partnerships because yeah, we can get enamored and maybe we get on really well with that company. Maybe we think this is a great add-on in addition, but maybe our our loyal customers won't see it that way. And I think that's a dimension that probably a lot of people miss when they're considering these things because they're saying, "Well, they're a partner, so well, what have they got to do with our brand?" Well, as you said, you you judge by the company you keep. Exactly. We always make sure that our values uh, and our beliefs overlap with the partners that we work with. Mm -hmm. And so d today, I mean, and you do a lot of work, I think, in hospitality and, and, and things like that. And today, it, it, we have really become um, very attuned to our customer experience, right? And the problem is that as human beings, you know, we tend to default to the, to, you know, the weak link in the chain. I, I always use the example of a number of years ago, I was flying, I think I was flying back from Ireland uh, and 
got to the airport, everything was smooth, got on the plane, great trip, everything was fantastic. Uh, got there actually a bit early, came down, bags were delayed and nobody came out to tell us why. So that a great a great trip just turned into one of the worst trips ever, just because, you know, we love to say, How was your trip? Oh, it was terrible, even though it wasn't, right? <laughs> right. The great the trip was wonderful. It's that last <laughs> and lasting impact. Um, so we we at Union Square Hospitality Group, uh, we, we subscribe to writing the a great next chapter is what we call it. So we mm -hmm. Danny Meyer, our chairman and um, wrote and founder wrote a book called Setting the Table. Right. Um, and it's not really a memoir. It's it's a business leadership. You know, it's a business leadership book, let's mm -hmm. say. And there are lessons in there that, that we've learned over the years that we've been in business. Um, and the essence of it is um, how you make people feel. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's about hospitality, right? And hospitality mm -hmm. is making people feel welcome, feel seen, uh, feel important, feel as though they belong. Right. Being a good host that or hostess, mm -hmm. is what, that's what that means. So what they didn't do for you was be a good host. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And it's funny you mention that because, yeah, because um, the research and surveys and stuff coming out right now are saying that the most important, it's, it's always been this way, but it's I think it's become accentuated lately, particularly because we were pushed back by tech, behind technology and then COVID. But people just want to be seen, heard and understood. If you can do that, you pretty much made them happy. And, and it seems a little sad because that seems like a bit of a baseline. But unfortunately, today, uh, a lot of people are falling below that. It's true. We, we do try to, in our company, we try to go one step beyond that. And, and that's what we teach. We teach that to others as well. So we, um, you know, in this job, I, I took this job and there's, I'm running two startups plus an existing business from a marketing mm -hmm. perspective. The two startups are Daily Provisions, which is an all-day cafe. And we could talk about that in a bit. Yeah. There's four uh, locations now and we're growing. The other startup is the relaunch of the, the consulting practice and leadership and development business called Hospitality Quotient. Right. And that's based on the teachings of the book. It's what we teach our own staff. It's about hiring the right people and, bring, and bringing out the best in them. Um, and we can teach that, those hiring practices to others. And we can also tell people how we do what we do right. and, and make sure that we are extending enlightened hospitality in all of our businesses mm -hmm. right and so what you were referring to is is just that it's it's first of all making people know that this is not service service is a one-way street mm -hmm. this is hospitality it's a relationship it's engagement um and so to be seen is baseline we, we, you walk in the door whether it's on our app or Yep. in our reservation system or in our actual door, and we welcome you. That's the first thing we do. Um, and if you've had a bad experience, we don't just make it right. We try to make it something that you'll go back and tell people about. Mm -hmm. I had wine spilled all over me at this restaurant the other night, and you wouldn't believe what they did to make it better. Right. They went out and bought me another shirt while I was eating dinner, <laughs> and I left with a brand new shirt. That's right. a true story. Those things happen here. That's what we teach. We teach that, uh, you know, the customer is not always right. We, we sometimes are right, but some, but no matter what, we should make it right. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a nuance. We should probably cut that part out. Yeah, no, 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 no. What you're saying is, is, is really good because I think that's the thing is like people don't realize it's, it's in those moments is when you create an awesome brand, right? Brand goes from being a good brand to an awesome brand. It goes in those in those moments when you do things that surprise people because people want to be surprised in a good way. Yes. Uh, and, and I think when you can, because we're all, our, our, it's almost like, as again, human nature, our, our antennas on up are, are always up to find something that's not quite right. So when we're surprised pleasantly, we actually have an, it has an outsized impact on us. Absolutely. And you know, the airline could have done something so simple to, mm. to make that a little bit better for you. Bring in some ice cream if it was a hot day and give everybody a little bit of sweetness while they waited for their bag. Just the smallest little gesture of saying, I'm so sorry this is happening to you. We wish it wasn't too, but yeah. here, here's something lovely. Yeah, that would, have been, that would have been absolutely fine. And just going back to the moment, uh, also you mentioned about the startup, right? So you're three or four 
locations now. And so when you have a startup and maybe it's scaling pretty quickly and you're growing fast, how do you manage then to keep everything, keep control of the brand? Because you can get carried away with like, oh, let's grow, grow, grow. And suddenly like things are getting scattered. Your hiring practices are maybe going out the window because you're just trying to get people in. So how do you control that so that you don't inhibit the momentum of the success, but at the same time, it doesn't get out of control either? Well, we have a perfect case study um, in Shake Shack, which Danny Meyer also founded. Mm. And their DNA is the same as ours. We're kind of cousins, even though they're a separate public company. Um, we, they have similar hiring practices and philosophies that we do. And our, our business philosophy is, is the virtuous cycle. And what that means is we start with the employee first. We believe that if we have the right employees with the right attitude and that we, if we treat each other well, that will then cause them, those employees, to treat our guests well, treat our suppliers well, treat our community well. And when you do all of those things in the virtuous cycle, so from employees to guests to community to suppliers and then to investors and then back to employees, it's a virtuous cycle and we we make happy people all along the way and we make money all along the way. So when you have that as your embedded philosophy, you hire for that, you train for that, you reward for that and you celebrate that. And mm -hmm. so every person in our company from, you know, the person who greets you at the front desk to the, to the instructor who, who leads the consulting practices yeah. To me, the CMO, we all know that that's what we're about. We're about taking care of each other. And then there, there are ways with it, you know, that we, we sort of bring that to life in our own unique way. And it's right. all in the book, setting the table. That's our employee handbook. Yeah. That's it's, by. Yeah. yeah. So, so just just on that, I mean, that I, I really like that. So it's basically the expectations are set by people and you – help them understand what, what excellence looks like. Because I think that's another issue sometimes that a lot of organizations have is, yeah, they might choose good people training, but they never show them what excellence really looks like. They just show them how to do a job. Yes, and we also hire for excellence. So we, we have this philosophy whereby we, we hire what we call 100 percenters. 51% mm -hmm. of the sort of grade you get when we're in the interview process is based on who you are how you show up every day, what your mental attitude is. You know, everybody can have a bad day, but by and large, your you know, your set point is a lovely person who wants to spread hospitality. Mm -hmm. so we call them hospitalitarians or 51 percenters. The other portion, 49 percent, equal, almost equally as important, right, yeah. uh, is that you have to be great at your job. Whatever we're hiring you to do, you either have to already be great at it or have the aptitude to learn to be great at it. So we hire 100 percenters. And one of the qualities is called the excellence reflex. Mm. It's the person who cannot walk past a paperclip on the rug without picking it up and putting it in, in its place. Or a, fo a photo on the wall, if it's crooked, they must straighten it. Mm -hmm. It's just natural for them to right. be a little bit obsessive about excellence and, <laughs> you know, so yeah. and I, I, we bring in. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I like that. And it also then means that, uh, you know, as things evolve, what often happens is we positions become available and whatever, you know, and we want to do the right thing by people. So sometimes we go, oh, look, I think they could do this job and we fit the person to the job rather than the job to the person. Or we or we get too hyper focused on what they're not doing well, as opposed to figuring out how we can leverage their strengths. And I think those are two things that often uh, derail a, a, a you know derail companies because they end up with people in positions who they're not really that suited for it, but they were there at the time and they mm -hmm. got it. Um, so I think that's an important thing too to make sure that you that you have career paths and that you help people, but you promote them into the right positions and not the wrong ones. True. We love to promote people within our company. We've done so, so many times since I've been here. It's just so rewarding. In fact, I, I took a couple of colleagues out to lunch today because we had a promotion within my team. 
So. <laughs> That's excellent. And then, so, I mean, on the one hand, you have that, uh, you know, you have that uh, startup that's uh, more consumer oriented and the other one, which is more of a professional services. So, mm -hmm. so what are some of the, what are, what are some of the similarities and differences when you're dealing with uh, two completely different types of brands? Oh, goodness. I was just thinking about that earlier yeah. because one of the questions you were supposed to be asking me was, you know, um, why did they hire you <laughs> if you came from t this big technology company yeah. and now you're in a restaurant group? Um, and that is because uh, I do have a strong B2B background and the consulting practices B2B, our, our catering practices are B2B, our private events company is B2B. And so there's a huge portion of, um, of revenue that, that you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're going after that, that requires a B2B marketing mindset. But I, I use the term B2B, which I absolutely deplore because it's people to people, mm -hmm. it's P2P, right? Um, so that customer experience, that, that guest experience, it's always about the person on the other end of the phone or the other end of the email or sitting in front of you. Um, and then there's the, the consumer business, you know, um, direct to consumer business and um, fast, not fast food, ca fast casual dining. Mm -hmm. So these all day cafes, um, I do have experience in retail and um, in loyalty and building, you know, customer lifetime value. Um, mm -hmm. What I didn't have for a long time was deep and extensive knowledge of uh, the restaurant category, but I'm married to a former chef. Oh, wow, <laughs> and go. so, you know, and I live in New York and food is one of my great passions. And <laughs> I love this, you know, this restaurant. And I've been a fan of Danny Meyer since the late 80s. So. Uh, it yeah, no, it's. It, it's great because it's very because it's it, it's very interesting and I think it's a good point that you make about it's all about people because we tend to forget that in 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 B two B sometimes and now because now we have more than one you often have more than one person on the buying committee or you have maybe seven ten it's gone up yes. to I don't know how many people involved in the buying process that you can easily just look at it as a monolith and just say oh you know we're I'm interacting with a company well no you're interacting actually with 10 individuals here and that's mm -hmm. what the challenge is that's so true when i was at hewlett packard enterprise we had between 14 and 17 people in the buying yeah can imagine they all were different job titles different types of folks some in tech sometimes in marketing sometimes accounting sometimes legal always purchasing how do you speak to all of them? And you know, you really need to speak to them as individuals and meet the needs that they have. And, and they're, they're somewhat different along that. And I think also also to recognize um, in B2B, like how much emotion is involved, because we sometimes forget about that too, because it's not just, you know, because as you said, there's people involved. So therefore, if I'm going to make a large purchasing decision, maybe I'm going to make an enterprise purchasing decision uh, that can that can be career enhancing or career limiting, depending on how it works or out. Or career ending. Yeah, <laughs> career ending even. So yeah. I have a lot, So there's a lot of emotion carried in there. And I think sometimes we we don't do enough good, uh, of a job of recognizing that and assuaging it. Well, imagine if you're uh, a corporate event planner or an executive assistant or chief of staff, and you're booking the the board dinner uh -huh. for your public company, and you're trying to choose the perfect restaurant for that board dinner. And the plan to hold it in New York when your company is actually headquartered in Chicago, but because right. three of the board members are in New York, this time they're going to do it in New mm -hmm. York. So we've empathized with that person. We recognize who he or she is in their hearts. And so we've created a one-stop information, interactive engagement, a booklet, an ebook, if you will, mm -hmm. for corporate event planners and for executive assistants who need to know where it is in town, how much does it cost, what kind of food is it, what, who is the chef, what kind of Michelin ratings do you have, and what's your capacity. Right. And so we've got that all stacked up and laid out, and they can then select them, compare three or four, and then present four options and have one point of contact here at the company to walk them through it with a white glove experience. And that's for everyone when they, you know, if that's their job title and they want to interact with us that way, we will try to make it just that easy for them. That's the B2B thing that, mm -hmm. you know, and, I and, bring. <laughs> and, what, and what you're, and what you're just beautifully outlined there is how, 
uh, you know, B2B experiences are becoming, you know, that there's no distinguishing between our expectations of a B2B experience and a, and a B2C or direct to consumer. We're very used to everything being very simple and easy. We can do all this stuff online for ourselves in our lives. Now we expect the same from businesses that we interact with now. So it's become quite a challenge. So what you outlined there is, is a perfect example of that in action. Thank you. And, you know, I have to give credit to a, our colleague that we brought in as a consultant. His name is Brad Rickman, and he comes from the likes of like Bloomberg and Condé Nast. And he de- he was one of the first to develop their handheld, their app, uh, their mobile right. experience, as well as their websites. So he's got that B2B mindset, but to a to a reader uh, or a viewer. And he said, Marissa, we're going to build this as a mobile experience first. And then we'll worry about the, the yeah. laptop because most of these folks are busy and they're out at events already or mm-hmm. planning meetings on the go. And they need to be able to have the, the perfect experience on their cell phone. Mm-hmm. And then if they want to go back to their desktop and work on it, that's fine. But let's start with the hardest one to design and make, yeah. it, make it as easy as ordering your lunch because mm-hmm. that's what people expect. The consumerization of technology. That's the other thing you asked, like why in, we're supposed to ask, <laughs> why, why are you coming from technology and going into hospitality? Well, every business is a technology business. Yeah. Right? And so all of that learning and, and education that I was able to get over the last eight years, the whole world has caught up to that now. And fortunately I'm, I'm ready for it. So I'm very happy. And, and my CTO, uh, Kelly McPherson and her team, of product innovators and digital innovation staff are just brilliant and they are always keeping us abreast of all of the best technology and and uh applications mm-hmm. out there for for our business and for our, our guests so it's pretty great yeah no it is it, it's fascinating and, and particularly like you said there about no i know your audience too because if you're right if you're an event planner you're going to be spending a lot of time out of the office. You're going to be in hotels. You're going to be going here. So if you started off with desktop first, yeah, it may be hand, it may be useful, but it's not handy. It's not like in your hand. It's not available that second, maybe when you're moving around. Um, so I like that. I love that idea of of really putting the person, you know, the the consumer in the center of it, and just figuring out how do they operate and giving them the best experience that way. And you're right. I mean, I think the the consumerization of of business technology business experience is only going to it's only going to increase to the point where i don't know whether we'll even be talking about differentiations in future we'll just be talking about types of businesses right yes yeah. yes so that experience comes out in about a month we're still putting the finishing touches on it <laughs> Excellent. Oh, we're well, at the same time this podcast will launch. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is fantastic. Well, listen, thanks very much, Marissa. All of Marissa's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Me? Yeah, well, you and the company. <laughs> you and your organization. I'm so happy to do so. Um, well, yes. So it's Union Square Hospitality Group. And uh, we are the proud founders of restaurants like Gramercy Tavern, Union Square Cafe, The Modern um, at MoMA, Blue Smoke, which is a great barbecue restaurant, Porchlight, it's a wonderful bar, and Marta and Maialino, our Italian brands, um, and our brand new baby, Chisiamo, which is also Italian. And those are the fine dining brands. And that's just one sliver of the company. Mm -hmm. Uh, We also have Daily Provisions, which I mentioned, which is an all day cafe and a beloved little gem, uh, which started here right next door to Union Cafe in Union Square. And now we have four more and we're opening another couple. Um, I can't say where yet, but everyone is going to be very, very happy uh, (laughs) because we get a lot of social media DMs saying, when are you coming to fill in the blank? Yeah. Um, so that's happening. And then, of course, we have our, our um, leadership and development practice called Hospitality Quotient, where we do classes here in New York. People from all over the world come to spend three days with us and have that experience. We just finished one last week. It was glorious. The furthest ones came from Bis- Brisbane. Wow. So shout out to them. Taryn, hi, Ben. Um, and then uh, we do that same thing for enterprise companies. So folks like Delta. Um, Marriott or American Express. We work with them with large groups of their folks to share our our best practices around hospitality and to make each other better. And so that's Mm -hmm. 
been wonderful. And there's lots more there that I can't talk about yet, but but that's oh, really that's it. significant. Yeah, and that's, that, that's the exciting stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's very right. exciting. <laughs> we have our corporate uh, um, events uh -huh. group, which is so much more than events. It's corporate catering. It's on-site food at uh, stadiums and and oh, racetracks right. and other places like that. It's just an, an enormous, wonderful business. They do the food on the on, on the cross continental flights of Delta Airlines first class. So you'll okay. hopefully you'll one day taste them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. from San Diego. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'll be looking forward to that. <laughs> well, listen. Thanks again, Marissa. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much.